Okay, so here's one of the thing that programmers use a lot, right? Exception and interrupts. And how is that impacting our hardware design? So exception is something that's internal to the running threads, right? Sometimes you throw exception, things like divide by zero. Uh, it's handled when detected by the process. And the priority is going to be ranked based on the process priority. So you can throw an exception to handle the, the divide by zero by maybe returning zero or something, right? That's a part of your code as well. Interrupt is external to the running thread. Things like when you're queuing the program or you type something on the keyboard or you use your mouse, right? This is handled when convenient by the OS and the priority can vary, right? And here's the thing. Whenever you have exception or interrupt, right? Things stop. Your your execution, the state of your execution essentially stop. And you handle the exception, right? So let's imagine divide by zero exception. So you do fetch, decode, execute, memory, and write back. When are you gonna detect sorry? When are you gonna de detect divide by zero? When can the hardware detect divide by zero exception? Here, right, in the execute. When you're detecting this problem, are you in the write back? No. So the programmer doesn't see the instruction yet. The instruction that in the write back is a different instruction. So let's say it's a pipeline design, instruction one here, instruction two here. Instruction three here, right? Instruction four is here. Instruction five is here. And instruction three cost divide by zero. In this case, the programmer still is waiting for instruction one to finish because it's trying to finish the write back stage, right? And when exception happen, what you need to guarantee is that instruction one and two finish Instruction three raise the exception and instruction four and five never happen. Again, this is what you have to do. Finish this. And this never happened. From the programmer point of view, this thing should happen. Instruction one and two is done. Instruction three cause the interrupt. Instruction four or five doesn't matter. It should never even exist until that point when you have to interrupt happen, right? Why is this the problem? One moment, sequential instruction processing, right? It assumed this essentially because you assume that instruction one is finished before two, two finished before three, three finished before four, four finished before five. And this helps software debugging. How many how many of you use functional programming before? Like program in a functional language before? How do you do that? Have done any functional programming at all? I know some of you did in the beginning uh, of this semester. You raised your hand, but I forgot whom. How do you like debugging that? Yeah, Haskell. Do you use Haskell before? Why why is functional program harder to debug than sequential program like Python, Java, and C? Because thing doesn't happen in order, right? It's a functional program. So whatever whenever function is ready, it fire off. And then you just wait until the function return and it keeps firing off all this instruction all the time. And there's no concept of a line, actually. There's no line. You just do whatever you have to do. It's like everything is a math function. And a big cat. A um well, well, I need my table. Give me a second. All right, that's like the most reaction out of this entire uh class from you guys. <laughs> Whenever the, the cat is in the video. 
All right, I'll, I'll, I'll yield my table. I'll just write it here on my lap. Um, yeah. All right. And this helps software debugging because whenever you are, let's say you have except like exception divide by zero, right? Most of the time you have to debug this like, oh, what happened? Why did I divide by zero? When you debug this, you expect that instruction one and two has to finish. And then you're waiting for instruction three and then instruction four and five never happen, right? And it should be easy to restart a process because let's say you handle the exception correctly, when exception happened, you want to return zero or something, right? And you continue execution, then you know where to continue, right? How can we ensure precise exception in super scalar architecture? Again, the, qu the question is, in the normal in order pipeline, this is easy. So this is easy to do with an in order pipeline. Now it gets hard because you have super scalar. So with super scalar, this can happen. You have fetch, decode, execute, memory, and write back. You have instruction one, one here, but instruction four is here because instruction four is a really fast instruction. Instruction three, that cause interrupt is here. Instruction two is here. Instruction five is here, right? Now what happened? Instruction three caused the interrupt. I know I can finish instruction one, that's okay. Instruction four is here. I guess I can throw it away. So that's, I guess, fine. Right? I can throw it away. Instruction three, three calls the interrupt. Instruction two is in the decode. What to do, right? It's not even dispatch, right? So what to do here? And then I guess I can squash this guy. So I throw it away as well, right? But as you can see here, I have instruction two come after instruction three, but instruction three calls the interrupt. What do I do here? I cannot really just easily move them through the pipeline and finish, right? I have to do something. I have to do something so that whenever the interrupt happen, the programmer just get confused because by the time interrupt happened, instruction two haven't even finished the decode. And you're supposed to stop right when interrupt happened. So if you want to stop right when interrupt happened, you haven't even seen instruction two. So one naive idea, which is a bad idea, is what if we make every single operation take the same amount of time, so that's why everything is in order. This can solve our problem because you're going to do instruction one, two, three, four, and five, but this is bad for performance, right? Downside is going to be bad for performance. So we need to think of a other way to maintain sequential state and way so that my cat's tail doesn't hit the next button. Um, Sorry, if you see the slide go really quickly, it's basically my cat is like typing on the keyboard now. Um, so there are ways you can do this. The first classic way is what we call the reorder buffer. Then there are alternate version of this called the history buffer. There's another alternate version called the future register file. And then we'll talk about checkpointing. We'll do one by one, all right? And now we're going to go into the next topic called how do we maintain sequential state whenever exception happen? Okay. So to do this, the first thing we can do, we can have the reorder buffer. The idea is I can do whatever order in the instruction. Then, then I have a big buffer that reorder everything back and make it visible to the architecture state. What it means is, I have this buffer. This buffer is basically allowing you to sort things to write back, All right? How do we do this? So now again, you have two buffer. You have the instruction window, right? Instruction windows has a bunch of fetch instruction, right? So instruction one, instruction two, right? Instruction three, right? So on and so forth. Then you dispatch. 
Now you want to add another buffer called the reorder buffer. Reorder buffer. Whenever you dispatch this, any of the instruction from the decode stage, right? What you do in the buffer is that You maintain the state that hey, you just dispatch. This is everything will be here be in order. Instruction one, instruction two, instruction three, instruction four, blah blah blah, right? Then over here it maintains the state about the instruction itself. For example, instruction one has to update. Let's say you have to update as zero. This one has to update. Uh, three, this one has to update. Uh, four, so on and so forth. And then you said another status, which is, are you done or not? If you're not done here, then you can make other people done. I'm done. I, I know what value to update for R3. I know the updated value of R3. I know the updated value of R4. Because the reorder buffer store that. But in my register file, right? In my register file, register file is gonna have this uh, 0, uh, 1, uh, 2, uh, 3, uh, 4, right? All these things. You are not updating the register file. So the programmer still see the correct in order results. You only update the register file whenever the oldest guy in the reorder buffer is done. So let's say some time has passed, right? Some time has passed, and I know the result of R0, the first instruction. Now some time has passed, I'm done here. What I do here is I update R0, and because I know R3 and R4, because they're both done now, I can update R3 and R4. And let's say this one caused the interrupt. Instruction four caused the interrupt, right? In this case, I just need to make sure I keep updating until instruction one, two, and three are done. If I have future instruction four, five, six, seven, eight, and they're done, it's okay because I have not updated the register file. I just only maintain the updated data in the reorder buffer. All right, so that's the idea. เดี๋ยวขอเป็นภาษาไทยนิดนึงนะครับก็คือว่าเราจะใส่บัฟเฟอร์อีกตัวหนึ่งเพราะว่าเรารู้อย่างหนึ่งที่เรารู้คือว่า register file อ่ะมันต้องถูกอัปเดตใน order เดิมก็คือ instruction 1 2 3 4 5 6 7เราจะมาอัปเดตแบบ1 3 4 2 7 8 5 6เนี่ยไม่ได้เราต้อง order เดียวกันเพราะฉะนั้นเทคนิคเราก็คืองั้นเราใส่บัฟเฟอร์ไว้ตัวหนึ่งบัฟเฟอร์ตัวเนี้ยมันจะ keep track ของแต่ละ instruction ที่เรา dispatch ไปแล้วเราบอกว่าเฮ้ยถ้าอันไหนเสร็จอ่ะก็แอบใส่ค่าไว้ตรงนี้แอบใส่ค่าไว้ในบัฟเฟอร์สมมุติมันเสร็จแล้วก็เอาค่า R5 R6 R7 ตัวใหม่ใส่ไปในนี้ไปเลยแต่ว่าเราจะไม่อัปเดตรีจิสเตอร์ไฟล์จนกว่าไอ้ instruction เก่าสุดอ่ะมันจะเสร็จพอ instruction เก่าสุดเสร็จปั๊บเราก็อัปเดตอัปเดตอัปเดตครับเพราะฉะนั้นอัปเดตของเราอ่ะมันจะเรียงตามออเดอร์การอัปเดตรีจิสเตอร์ไฟล์มันจะเรียงตามออเดอร์นี้เลยนี่คือออเดอร์ของการอัปเดตนะครับ So this allows you to update the register file, which is what the programmer see. That's the only thing the programmer see. The programmer doesn't see the instruction window. The programmer doesn't even realize that there's this reorder buffer. And to be honest, if you talk to most programmer in the world, I would, I would bet my money on like 90% of the programmer doesn't even know what's the reorder buffer, right? Because it's not important to them. What's important to them is What's in the register file? What's my register value? And that's it, right? And that's nice because this allows us to keep improving the hardware, and the programmer still doesn't have to worry about what happened. Hopefully, it's correct, right? Now, the next question is: I have this reorder buffer, right? What do I have to put in there? The next question: What do I have to put in there to have a functioning reorder buffer? The first thing I need is the valid bit. This is basically a zero on one value. Zero means this is a bogus entry, it's not valid, don't use it. One means this is a valid entry that store, for example, the destination register ID. This is basically 
the pair that contain the updated value of my register. For example, if my instruction has to update R0 to 10, update the value of R0 to 10, then the register ID is going to be 0 because you're trying to update R0 and the value is going to be 10 and then the valid bit will be 1 whenever you have the updated data and 0 if the, the value is still not the current value that you're supposed to do. If you have a memory instruction, then you might have to store the address and the value as well, right? You might have to store the address and the value as well. Then you store things like instruction type. This is a compute versus the memory instruction, right? Another thing you can do is you have each reorder buffer for each instruction type. There's a reorder buffer for compute. That's a reorder buffer for the load and store. Sometimes we call this the load store unit. We'll go into more detail next week. All right. So with the reorder buffer and data forwarding and pipelining, now your input to the instruction, right? Let's say you have to add, you have to do this, add, uh, 0, R1, uh, R2, uh, which is basically you want to do R1 plus R2 and write the result into R0. This means that the value of R1 and R2 can be somewhere. The three locations are the data forwarding part. This is basically data forwarding, right? It can be in the wiring. It's like, hey, you just finish execute stage. If here's the data, take it. Or the register file or the reorder buffer. The reorder buffer now hold the most updated version, if not in the forward path. So the next question is, how can I tell which data should I use, right? Which data should I use? Solution is through indirection. Because now again, you have three options. I can get my data from the register file, I can get the data from the forward path, and I can get my data from the reorder buffer. And some of these might be old, some of these might be too new for you. Your instruction 10, the instruction in the reorder buffer is instruction 9, but in the forward part, it has instruction 12 in there. So you want the value from instruction 9, not 12, right? So let's say your instruction is, like your instruction, is instruction 10. The reorder buffer has instruction 9's update. The forward part is already doing instruction 12. Register file is too old, it's instruction 8. But you need this guy. How can you tell, right? You cannot always rely on, I'll just take the most updated version, which is 12, it's too far. Your instruction is instruction 10, so you need that from the reorder buffer. So now the technique is how can we figure out which one are we taking in hardware? So the solution is we can use indirection. We go to the register file. Register file is going to have a new bit called the valid bit. If the valid bit is one, basically it means that this is the most updated version of the value you execute normally if it's valid. If the register file doesn't have the valid bit of one, you then store. So instead of regi register file, right? Go over here, register file, and you have the reorder buffer. This is the valid bit, this is the data. So this R0, R1, R2, and R3. And let's say you want to access R2, right? Now the valid bit, let's say it's zero. If the valid bit is zero, over here, the data is supposed to be old, right? So to know where to go next, over here, if the valid bit is zero, it means that someone has the updated version of this data. You then store the pointer to the reorder buffer entry that also, again, have the valid bit. So you have the pointer to the reorder buffer and say, get the data from there. If it's valid, you have the value. You take that value. 
right? Then you access a reorder buffer. If the reorder buffer doesn't have the valid value, check the forward path. Now this allow you to create the mapping, right? So if this is a valid entry, it might have the actual value. It means R1 has a value of five. It is not valid. It might have the pointer to a different entry here, right? Which has some valid bit and value. This allow you to figure out, okay, where to get my data. So over here, right? Uh, to access the reorder buffer, again, this is a register file, right? Let's say you have the two instruction. I want to add R1 and R2 into R3. R3 is required by the next instruction, right? So the first instruction may do R1 plus R2. Everything is valid, right? This is valid bit. One, 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 one. And let's say this is value one, uh, zero, one, two, three, right? This is a value, right? So when you do this in the reorder buffer, right? In the reorder buffer, you're going to have this instruction, right? This instruction at R3, R1, R2. It initially will not be valid. You know that you are trying to modify R3 and the value is going to be 0, uh, 1 plus 2, right? So that's going to be number 3, right? You're going to modify that value. Then the next add comes in, and it's like, oh, I need R3 and R2. You'll first, and because the, the first add modify R3, so I said R3 is not valid. In store, instead of storing this data, it stores this pointer to the entry here, right? This is row number zero. That's the first instruction. So instead of the value, you store the row ID of my reorder buffer. So this is row zero. Right, row zero. It's going to be row one, row two, right? And you keep going. So in this case, you store that, hey, the the R3 is not valid. If you need them, go check row zero in the reorder buffer. Now, instruction two comes in, this guy, right? I said, I need R2. R2 is fine. Okay, I know R2 is valid. Number two. R3 is here. Oh, it's not valid. Where do I check? Row zero. I now check row zero, which is this guy. It's not valid yet because I'm still in the execute stage. Then I check the forward path. Who has the updated version of R3? Then you forward. All right. So the problem with the reorder buffer, for example, can be something like this. With the following code, right? App update to R3. So this from the old version of R3, sorry, old R3. Now you have the newer version of R3. Let me call this R3 prime. Now you have another version of R3, R3 double prime. Now you have the another version of R3, R3 triple prime, right? So now with R3, you have the original R3, R3 prime, R3 double prime, R3 triple prime, and this guy needs R3. So which one out of these four choice do they use, right? Because here's the problem. In the register file, it only store one row in the reorder buffer. So it means that you can only store one version of R3. But over here, as you can see, this one need R3 prime. But this one need R, wait, R3 prime. Yeah, this one needs R3 double prime. The two instruction need two version of R3. And you have you don't have enough, right? You don't have enough knowledge to know where is R three prime and where is R three double prime. Let's translate this in Thai again, just to make sure everyone is on the same page. Because the problem at this point, we have version of R three many times. Instruction one, it solves R three. 
อินสตรัคชันที่3ก็แก้ค่าอ่าสามอินสตรัคชันที่5แก้ค่าอ่าสาแล้วอินสตรัคชันที่2กับ4อ่ะมันต้องการอ่าสแต่ว่าอินสตรัคชันที่2ต้องการอ่าสามเวอร์ชันที่เป็นอ่าสามพรายอินสตรัคชันที่4ต้องการอ่าสามดับเบิลพรายแล้วด้วยความที่เรารันไฮปลายเรามันไม่ไม่ได้เป็นออเดอร์เดิมอยู่แล้วอ่ะเราจะไม่รู้เลยว่าอาสามพรามอยู่ตรงไหนและอาสามดับเบิลพรามอยู่ตรงไหนเพราะว่าเราเก็บได้แค่อันเดียวในรีออเดอร์บัฟเฟอร์คือรีออเดอร์บัฟเฟอร์มันจะเก็บได้แค่มันมีหลายเอนทรีนี่แหละแต่ว่าเราชี้ไปได้แค่อันเดียวว่าอันเนี้ยเราต้องเลือกเลยว่าจะเอาอาสามพรามหรืออาสามดับเบิลพรามหรือว่าเป็นอาสามทริปเปิลพรามไปแล้วนะครับเพราะฉะนั้นเราก็จะทําให้โปรเซสเซอร์เราช้าลงเพราะว่าเราต้องสตอปนะ so basically this This create a problem that each version of R3 has has to have their own version name, right? We don't have we don't have enough register file, right? So the problem is whenever you want R3, you go check at the register file, right? And in the entry for R3, it will have the pointer, right? A single pointer to one single version of R3. And because register file only have one R three, my pointer can only point to R three, R three prime, R three double prime, and R three triple prime. I don't have enough name for each of these version. How do we do this? We use a technique called register renaming. Actually, if you go back to this, this is basically right after read and right after write. Data hazard. This has to mean that you have to stall the pipeline. You have writes that happen after read, but read needs the data from the write. You have write after write, and the write needs the information from the write. These create data hazard, and you stall the pipeline. Right. Now the solution is. If I don't have enough ID, right? If I don't have enough ID, and my register, like register three, for example, can only store one latest value of my register, we use the same technique: indirection, right? Indirection. We have the register ID. Instead of having the register ID storing the ID, you store the reorder buffer entry ID. But the only difference here is this is gonna always point to the most updated one, most updated entry. And the architectural register does programmer visible. Right, that programmer visible that the same register file. So this is called reg register renaming. And here's the example, right? Now, this is a reorder buffer, right? The tag is just a running number in use search. So let's say zero, one, two, three, and four, right? And let's call this instruction. Uh, Instruction zero, instruction one, instruction two, and instruction three. Okay, when you first fetch the first instruction, right? and and let's assume this has the value 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. The valid bit originally, right? It's gonna be a one. Everything is valid, and this is your register file. All right. Now, the first instruction come in get fetch. I need R1 and R2. I'm trying to do an add, right? R1 and R2 are valid. Okay. So source one for the first instruction is going to be what? R1, right? I know the value, so that's 11. R2 is 12. The value I don't know yet. So let's just say X, right? I don't know. I'm trying to do an add right now. And this is not valid because I don't know the result yet. It's not valid. I'm trying to finish the app. Then you fetch the next instruction. Although actually before you fetch, you know that you're modifying R3. 
So to do this, to make sure you have the updated version of this in the register file, right? You first need to get rid of this old value because that's old and uh, no one no one needed anymore. Now this become not valid. The this store the tag for the entry that I can point to is to get the most version, the most recent version of R three. So in this case, let's go to tag zero, which is this guy. All right. Now the multiply said I need R three and R five. I go look at R three. Uh, source one, right? Source one R three. R three has tag zero. Actually, let me rename the tag to, to reduce confusion. All right. I think it's better to just name this A, B, C, D, and E. Sorry about that. A, B, C, D, and E. And this corresponds to the instruction. So this is going to be A, B, C, and D, right? Now, R3 is updated by instruction one, right? That's tag A. So you know that if you need R3, you can go look at tag A. Instruction two come in, the multiply, I, I need R3 and R5. R3, I look at the register file, it's not valid. So I know, okay, go to tag A. That's where I can get my data. Because it's not valid yet, I check, I check tag A and say, like, oh, it's not valid. I don't have that yet. So I'm going to store tag A. I know that source one, what I need is in tag A. Source two is R5. R5, I go check the register file. It's valid, so I can put in 15. I know that's valid, right? The value, as I said, is why I'm waiting. I'm not even executing, right? It's not valid as well. All right. Now I can fetch. The third ad is R3, R4, and R7. I want R4, I want R7, right? R4 is valid, so it's 14. R7 is valid, it's 17. I am doing an ad, so let's say it's C, right? It's not valid yet. Okay. Now I can fetch. The third instruction, I need R3 and R2. Oh, actually, I, I forgot one more thing. Okay. So when I'm finishing the multiply, I need to update R6 over here, right? Because it's writing the result to R6, I need to update the register file. Sorry, what else? I forgot. Uh, update the register file that is not valid anymore. If you need R6, go look at tag B because B is updating R6. All right now again with the third instruction right with the third instruction is modifying r3 right because it's modifying r3 this is not valid and it used to be pointing at tag a but you know the third instruction is also modifying r3 so now the tag for r3 is going to be c anyone that come after me if you need r3 go look at entry c and here's the thing, because you already marked the earlier version of R3 that's used by the second instruction, right? So these R3, because you have this guy, source one and source two, you know that the instruction will go to tag A for the data. Now the third instruction, R3 plus R2, R3 is not valid, right? R3 is not valid, but you know it's from C, not from A. And then for R2 is valid. So if you put in 12, it's not valid. Let's say you put in W, right? Now with the new version of reorder buffer, now you have the ability to keep track of each version of the, the, the R3 that you need. And in here, let's say the add finish, right? Let's say the first add finish. And you're done. 11 plus 12, uh, that's 33, right? You know now the value is 33. You have the valid value. So whoever needs A, you can come to me and get the value. So you update A to 33. Now you can dispatch B. Now you know, okay, B is ready. I can dispatch and start doing the multiply. Instruction C, finish first. Because it means 
it needs 14 and 7 and it's done, right? So let's say this this gets dispatched up for a while and it's done. So 14 plus 17 is 31. Oh, actually, I did the not add two number, I'm sorry. That's 22, uh, 23. So there's 23, 23, right? Now let's say this fit this instruction finish. You know the value is 31. Now you know that C has the value, so you can update the source one for instruction D. Because you know that 31. Now you can dispatch D, right? And because we order buffer, right, hold the most updated version of this, what you have to hold next is what's called the architectural register file, right, to make sure that this is what the programmer see, right? Now you can search the reorder buffer for the orders instruction. And yeah. All right, now you can search the orders instruction and wait until my head goes down from that place. That's weird. Okay. Um, yeah, it was that loud banging in the background. What happened? Uh, one jumped and she's up there. So the program will see the active of your register file. And you can still maintain the state in the future. Always going back and know the correct version. So that's register renaming. OK. Now the next structure is called the history buffer is the slightly different variation of what we talked about earlier. The way history buffer works is that what if we can undo and update? So instead of storing the future, like we instead of accessing a register file or storing the older version of the, of the data, we maintain the future version of the data, we, we get rid of the register file that has the old version, but we store the buffer of history that has the old value, right? If there's an exception, use the old value. This is the architecture of state and go from there. So the Difference is for reorder buffer, the update to the register file will be the one the programmer see. Programmer will always see the one in the register file. And this can delay accessing new value. The history buffer allows you to update the register file with the speculative value, which is what you saw earlier, where the, I look, I, I point at the reorder buffer entry that has the updated value. Now with the history buffer, you need to lock the old value. So what you saw from the example is the version of use both of them, right? So to use both of them, you can have the two copy of the register file. One copy is called the architectural register file. The other copy is called the future file. The future file basically contains this valid, right? and then the value, right? So the valid bit can be one and some value like 10, 12, non, not valid entry A, not valid entry C. So that's a future file. You know where to go in the reorder buffer. And then the, in the architectural register file, everything is always valid, right? And it's gonna be the, 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 the value, 12, 13, 14, blah, blah, blah. If exception happen, use the architectural file. During the execution, use future file. So you keep, again, two copy of the register file. The future file get update. Whenever I have new instruction in the reorder buffer, I update the future file with the tag. The architecture style, uh, register file doesn't have the tag, doesn't have the valid bit, just the old register file value. Then the future file work as I show you from the example that we did earlier architectural file uh, update using the reorder buffer. So this is updated when the orders instruction in the reorder buffer is done. Once the orders guy is done, you update the architecture file. So if exception happened, take that. 
Yes, there's no exception use future file that uh, get rid of this problem. So this is basically the full, full example. It's a recap of the same code that you saw earlier. So I'll use tag, the same tag, A, B, C, and D, right? Now instruction A, instruction B, instruction C, instruction D. Future, let's assume both of them originally have the same value, right? So the accuracy of file has 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Future file only have the tag, right? So originally it's valid. So it's 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. You fetch the first instruction. You need R1 and R2, R1 and R2. You look at the future file. It's 11 and 12. I don't know the value. It's not valid. Then I fetch. Uh, actually, it, it, and then it's modifying R3. Because it's modifying R3, right? I would just say, hey, future file, update this. R3 comes from A. Architectural file stay the same. In the multiply, I want R3 and R4, right? I want R3 and R4. So source one is going to be R3. I look at future file. Well, I don't have that. So it's A. R4 is 14, right? The value is going to be Y. It's not valid. Now, the second instruction modify R5. So I go at look at R5, modify the future file, right? So R5 is going to become B. Third instruction need R6 and R7, right? R6 and R7 is 16 and 17. It's both of them are valid, so you can actually dispatch them. So right now in the pipeline, you have instruction A and then instruction C, right? You're computing this. It's not valid. You wait for the data. It's modifying R3. Because you're modifying R3, you change R3 in the future file, right, into C. Fourth instruction comes in, I need R3 and R2. R3 is now, you look at future file. C, R2 is 12. Uh, w, right, not valid. And then because I am updating R3, because I'm updating R3, so what do I do? I update the future file with entry D. Now with multiple version of R3, I'm still good. I can just keep holding the up the most updated version in the future file then in my uh rob i have the in order right so let's say instruction a finish let's say instruction a finish what you have to know now is like okay i am updating r3 i have the 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 value it's valid i have the value which is 23 whoever needs a it's going to be updated the source to 23, right? And because that's the oldest instruction, because that's the oldest instruction, I can get rid of this particular row. I know that I'm updating R3 in the architecture file into the value 23. So I know that, okay, I'm updating this. This becomes uh, 23. Let's use a different color. Okay, 23. Now, when I am done with instruction C, because instruction C can be dispatched, right? There's no dependency here. Right now, you're also dispatching this instruction B. So this one is done. This one is dispatched, right? It's running. Instruction D is not even being dispatched because it's waiting for C. But let's say C is done. So I can... Do the add, right? Uh, and then the, you have a valid value. This becomes uh, 60 plus 17, that's 33, right? So you know that you can replace the C here with 33, right? And then you dispatch insertion D. All right. Because that's not the oldest guy in the reorder buffer, I keep the architectural register file the same because I still need to wait for B to finish. This way, if I have an exception in the instruction B, somehow B cause exception, I look at the architectural file, okay, 
because because exception, here's the most updated version of my register. Instruction C and D never happen from the programming point of view. It's still in a future file. If I handle the exception, come back, I have to state. I can resume right away. All right. If there's no exception, be finished. Right. Let's say there's no exception, be finished. This become valid. Um, that become 23 multiplied by 14. Whatever value it is, I don't want to do the multiply right now. You're updating R5, right? So you uh, erase this pointer option, eraser. Both future file and architecture file are waiting for this, so it's going to be 23 multiplied by 14, right? And now you also can update C, which modify R3. No one needs C anymore in the architecture file. The only thing you have to do is, okay, that's the next instruction that I have to do. I will update 23 into 33 because that's the ne next version of my R3. Then you finish instruction D and you update instruction uh, 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 D. Uh, with the new value of R3, right? So whoever needs D will have the new value of R3. And that's gonna be uh, fifth, uh, 45, right? So it's gonna be 45 here, 45 here, and 45 here. This allows you to maintain precise exception. This allows you to maintain uh, aggressive super scalar architecture. All right. Any question? We can have a have. I mean, I'm a long time out of EDF. I'll power. The long time do what I don't know. Ah, they call it by the high like an a Don't be so move out from the time will be good exception. คือด้วยความที่ว่าเรามี architecture file architecture file ก็คืออันที่โปรแกรมเมอร์เห็นใช่ไหมครับแล้วเราไม่ได้อัปเดตคือสมมุติ C เสร็จแล้วอ่ะเรายังรอให้ B เสร็จก่อนเพราะว่าเราจะไม่อัปเดตตัวนั้นตัวนั้นจนกว่า B จะเสร็จเพราะฉะนั้นใน architecture register file ซึ่งโปรแกรมเมอร์เป็นคนเห็นว่าไอเนี้ยคือค่าอะไรอ่ะเราจะยังไม่อัปเดต R สามให้เป็นสามสิบสามเราแค่เก็บค่าในอนาคตมันไว้ใน reorder buffer เพราะฉะนั้นถึงมี exception ตู้ขึ้นมาเนี่ยโปรแกรมเมอร์ก็เอาค่าใน architecture file ไปได้เลยเพราะว่าไอ้ค่าในอนาคตอ่ะเราแอบเก็บไว้ใน future file ซึ่งโปรแกรมเมอร์ไม่เห็นซึ่งมันก็จะเป็นลิงก์ไปที่แบบอย่างตรงตรงนั้นตอนนั้นมันลิงก์ไปที่ entry d แล้วเนาะตอนตอนที่เกิด exception มันลิงก์ไปที่ entry d แหละส่วน instruction c ก็คือเสร็จแล้วอ่ะได้เลขสามสาม entry d กำลังรันอยู่ใน pipeline แต่โปรแกรมเมอร์ไม่เห็นไงคือโปรแกรมเมอร์ไม่เห็นตอน exception เกิดขึ้นก็คือ architectural file ก็จะเป็นตัวตัวค่าเก่าอยู่ซึ่งเอาไปใช้ได้เคลียร์เคลียร์ขึ้นเปล่าถ้าถ้าถ้าอธิบายแบบนี้พอพอเห็นภาพขึ้นไหมครับโอเคก็เดี๋ยวอยากให้ลองทำด้วยตัวเองรอบหนึ่งเราดูว่ามันตรงกับสไลด์หรือเปล่านะครับเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวอันนี้ก็เรา recording เหรอมันก็จะไปอยู่ในวิดีโอนะครับ So the next thing uh, is, well, having two copy of the register file is costly because I mean, we burn hardware. Uh, you can use the redirection for this. You can only, I mean, you, you can use the technique called register aliasing table. Um, we will kind of go into more detail next week because we, I want to put this with out of order execution as well to kind of like put everything in, into one piece of, uh, practice example okay uh this basically the idea is i store the mapping to this speculative register value and the architectural map is used for state recovery right so again i'll do this i'll do this in the in the example next week because it's a it's an old exam that i use right and i'll, I'll basically show you how this is done the PDF has the practice area that you can like draw things on your own. So I think it's better to do it there. Okay. The last thing I have to talk about today is checkpointing. 
checkpointing is basically when let's say let's say you're running things out of order and you have branch and you're mispredicting, right? You miss you you have branch misprediction. This is different from exception because exception you basically have to finish whatever is coming earlier and you handle the exception, right? Branch. One thing you can do is you can checkpoint. You can checkpoint. Whenever you see the branch, you create a copy of the future file saying, hey, in case you mispredict, use this copy. Otherwise, keep the old, I maybe mean, the, the future, whatever is updated value. This checkpoint copy are updated with an instruction that produce a register value, right? And upon misprediction, you go back to your checkpoint and you flush whatever is in the pipeline. Uh, quick recap on this. How many of you, well, you all play, play games before, right? You play games before. So let's say I'm, I'm playing the game that has two options, option A and option B. What I would usually do, I would save the game and then I'll pick one option. If that option is basically what I want, I keep playing. And that's, I'm also okay. I mean, I don't need to save file anymore, right? I keep playing. If option A is not what I want, I load the game, then pick option B. Same concept. Every time you see a branch, you store, you checkpoint the future file, and basically keep going. Pick one option and keep going. Like do the branch prediction, keep going. If the prediction is wrong, go back to your checkpoint go to another branch, all right? มีคำถามไหมครับสำหรับ checkpoint? checkpoint คือมันจริงๆมันคอนเซปต์มันง่ายมากเลยก็คือว่าพอเราเจอ branch เราก็เก็บ copy ของ future file ไว้เราก็เดาไปก่อนถ้าเดาถูกเย้เราก็ไปเรื่อยๆถ้าเดาผิดก็โอเคกลับมาที่ copy เดิม flush ทุกอย่างไปเราก็กลับไป run ฝั่งที่ถูกเท่านั้นเองครับ As I said, we actually end earlier than expected. Before we leave today, we we'll don't forget project proposal access. Uh, make sure I'm um, uh, updated with uh, your at least your idea on what you want to do. I know that some of you have deadline. You you send an email, so I appreciate that for sure. And good luck with your uh, your paper uh, and your submission. All right. Uh, please go work on your project. Um. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I always thought that back when I left, <laughs> so, like right before. So I'm pretty sure you're like squeezed on time. So that's nature. You get used to it. It's like PhD uh, deadlines. Always fun. Always not fun when you're the lead author, to be honest. But yeah. Um, sorry. All right. So if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. I'll be here maybe for five to ten more minutes. Otherwise, if you do not have any questions, uh, that's it for today. I I know it's a little bit early. Uh, we will do the full blown example with out of order execution and what we call the Thomas Lu algorithm is the algorithm that kind of explain how we do, how can we do everything with an actual example from the previous day exam. So the example we have like a, a setup uh, that that actually can work much better than the PowerPoint slides, right? So we'll do it next week. Then I will wrap, wrap up basically the first half of the semester. <laughs> we have already first half. Um, in the review session, and then we we will kind of do a Q&A on like what's going, going to be on the exam, what will be the day on the, of the exam, uh, talk a little bit about what's coming after the exam, all right? Uh, let me stop the recording right now and wrap up the session. Thank you.